I was meditating. I felt the Lord said, preach on nothing is too difficult for God. Amen. Thank you for those three amens. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, nothing's too difficult for God. And I know we say this in our religiosity, like, oh yeah, all things are possible. Praise the Lord, brother. But are we living like we believe nothing's impossible with God? Are we living like God is greater, that God is all-powerful, that he's all-knowing, that if God says something, it's going to come to pass, even though there's delay, it's not denial. But if God has destined something, it's going to come to pass. The promises of God and his word are yes and amen. It's going to come to pass. And sometimes we know that in our religiosity, we know it in our mind, but faith leaks in our heart. What are the promises God has spoken to you? What are the things that God's put in your heart? If they haven't come to pass yet, don't let go of it. Begin to know that it doesn't matter that how long it takes. If God said it, it's going to come to pass. The, the great heroes of faith, which we're a part of, in Hebrews 11, it talks about them. They died yet not seeing the promise, but they still didn't deny Daniel is getting ready to be thrown in the fiery furnace. He says, whether the, the, the Lord delivers or not, I'm standing in faith. Amen. It wasn't about what was happening in the natural. And God delivered. I mean, he made a better story. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, I better go with the fourth man in the furnace. But what if there was no fourth man? What if they died not bowing but lost their lives? All of the apostles except for one was martyred. Come on, those are, that's the board of the church, the early board of the church. Those are the founding fathers. All were willing to die. Paul's greatest impact was not on his missionary journeys. It was writing letters from prison. And we were there, a hole in the ground. But they're still in victory. They said even when the, when the guards came and the Romans came, they didn't, weren't sure whether the prison guards were saved yet. Because Christianity was, was coming and moving so powerfully. There's a, there's a traditional story. It's not in the Bible. I don't know if it's true, but it, I believe it might be true. Where, where Paul's in this hole. He's in prison and people there and he's preaching the gospel. And he's telling people about his faith. And they wanted to get baptized. And so he prayed and water came out of a spring out of the rock. And we saw where the water is. And he baptized people in the prison. I, I think more people probably got saved after that if that's a miracle. Now, Pastor, well, I don't know if that's true. It's not in the Bible. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's not in the Bible. Come on. The book of Acts is still being written. Amen. Come on. We're part of the books of the uh, book of Acts. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We're still relevant. God is still doing amazing things, amazing miracles. There's miracles that have happened over the last 2,000 years that are not in the Bible, but they're still miracles. And you see, and they're willing to, to, to lay down their life. We went and we saw, and Paul was a uh, Roman. So because of that, he died the death of a Roman soldier. Uh, an honorable death was you, you got your head chopped off. Dying on the cross was a criminal. So Peter was hung upside down, you know, there. They don't know exactly where, but somewhere where the Vatican is. And we, we were there, we looked at that. But Paul, because he was a Roman uh, citizen, he had the right to, to, to an honorable death. And so we went to the road where, where Paul walked in on this road where he went and, and we saw the, the actual pillar where they would put his head and they chopped his head off. History says that, that during that time, those that, you know, had to do the duty, they usually got drunk because they didn't want to have the trauma. So they'd get drunk. Can you imagine a drunk person holding an ax over your head? I'm... But in that place, we went there and the church was there where, where history says that's where it happened. And, and, and you know, it's, it's documented where Paul was probably, that's where the head was. They, there's three fountains there. And it's very weird. Three fountains in the middle of a church. Like, you know, you don't usually see that. But tradition says when they took Paul's head and chopped off his head, his head hit the floor three times and three fountains came out. Mama. Now, I don't know. I saw the fountains, though. Never seen anything like it. I'm not going to preach that as gospel, but... That was the power of, of what was happening because when you make a testimony for God, come on, you can preach even with your life and signs and wonders follow the preaching of the gospel. Come on. The blood still cries out. And you think uh, our, our faith is founded on, a, on someone who was crucified as a, as a criminal and all of his followers also were martyred. That's who we follow. And the, the Christianity went throughout the whole world. Why? Because those that laid down their life, those that came behind said, if they would lay down their life and pay a price for our faith, who are we not to give our lives for Jesus Christ and to live our lives wholeheartedly for him? Come on. That's our faith. Christianity is not about us just coming to get our needs met. That's idolatry. Now, God will bless you, but you're not here in church to be blessed. I want to come to church. I want to get blessed by the message this week. You're here to bless somebody. 
You're here to bring a hymn, a psalm, a usher, do something. We come together as the family of God. Come on. Yeah. And when we do that, it's great. I love Thanksgiving because we, we usually share with the marshals. But guess what? We all bring something. Yeah. We all cook something, you know. We leave the baking to Anwen because she's a master baker. But, but we bring something. And when everybody brings something, it's so much easier. It's such a great, a better meal because everyone brings and adds their distinctive to it and, and, and does what they're good at. That's the church. Yeah. And so we got to get back to our faith. That's the faith that we believe in. And it puts something in us that nothing's too possible for God. Come on, we, our faith never should have started. Yeah. The founder of our faith was, was murdered. But three days later, rose from the dead. But he rose into heaven 40 days later. He's at the right hand of the Father. We worship a Jesus we've not seen with the flesh. But we worship him in spirit and truth, and you see the impact. There's no way that you cannot say that the people did not believe in the resurrected Savior because nobody would die for something they don't believe in or something they learned third hand, Revelation. No, no way. And you see the wealth. And now Paul, who died a criminal, you got St. Paul's Cathedral here and St. Paul's Basilica there, St. Paul Street there. The honor because he gave his life. If a seed falls in the ground and dies, it will bear forth fruit. And not here preaching the negative, but come on, we need to get that back into our faith. That if we have to lose some friends for speaking truth, so be it. If I have to lose some followers on Facebook because they don't like the truth, I'm sorry, but I'm going to speak the truth. In love, not with arrogance, but the truth, the whole truth. So help me God. Amen. Nothing but the truth. And we need to get back because right now it's truth. You, know, you believe what you want and we want to be sensitive. I'm not here about demeaning other religions because everyone's seeking God. But all of this nonsense, well, all religions lead to God. No, they don't. They lead to demons, many of them. There's only one way. He's the way. He's the truth. And he's the life. God, don't get quiet on me. That's the Bible. That's written in red. And we need to get that back. So we're not going to bow down. Don't, don't redefine family for me. Bible says this is family. Adam and Eve were fruitful and multiplied. Are you here? And, and, and that's the Bible. That's what God had to build up a family that would begin to take the, the nations for him. That would be an example of those that raise their children in the ways of God. That's their all we have legacy. In that era, in that time, if the firstborn had to get married and, and procreate and, and you know, continue the family line. The second born son usually went into the army to become a knight, to fight, to defend the faith and defend the, the, those that were coming in to, to, you know, to destroy the Christian nations at that time. And then the third son would go into ministry and become a priest. I think that's a pretty good tradition. And that's how the family had the legacy. One carried the family business, the name. The other was involved in fighting and becoming a warrior. And the other went into the priesthood. <laughs> and that was considered a successful family among the Christian faith at that time. You got real quiet for me right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Who wants to become a knight? I mean, but they would da lay down their life. But they prospered. You see the cathedrals and they built these beautiful churches. We went to one of the churches in, 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 that was there in, in Barcelona, and uh, so not Barcelona, in uh, Malta. And the Knights of Malta out of the Order of St. John were there. And you know, every knight had their own prayer closet. Wow. Jesus said, go into your secret place. They built their own secret place with their own money. And you look at the splendor and the, and the goal and the, because they did it to honor God and they would go there and spend hours praying before they would go to battle and they were undefeated for more than 200 years. All the, we look at our history, we need to know where we've come from and our culture, we redefine it many times in our Western Christianity where we get things backward. Come on, God doesn't exist for us. We exist for God. He gave his life for us, but he said we got to take up our cross and follow him. And if we don't do it, we're not worthy of the kingdom. That needs to be preached. And God's raising up a remnant. Come on. Not just the wheat and the tares that look the same and all say hallelujah. But one has fruit and bears forth fruit and there's multiplication and there's impact. Come on, and the fruit will remain in Jesus' name. Amen. Christianity is not a weak, mild-mannered faith. It's, it's a faith of people who are willing to give their lives, who are bold 
in the midst of opposition to stand up for what they believe for. And friends, when we have that kind of faith, let me tell you, nothing will be impossible. Because the Bible says, as you preach the gospel, signs and wonders will follow the preaching of the gospel. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, the Lord said this. He said, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah will have a son. Now, if you know the history here, Sarah was beyond the years of childbearing. She had gone through menopause. There were no more eggs. Come on. So whether you got a seed and no egg, you can't have multiplication. But God said that he was going to do it in the midst of what's scientifically impossible at that time. I know your brains are going, well, you can do this now. You know, at, at that time, it's scientifically impossible. God says, I'm going to do it. Why? Because if God has said something, nothing is too difficult for God. And many of us, we need to, we go weary and well-doing as we're going through the trials of life. We lose sight and we forget that we serve a God that's all, that's all powerful. Yeah. We forget we serve, we, we're on the winning side. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your bank account says. It doesn't matter what, you, what, your, what people around you say. It doesn't matter what your struggle is in your life. Come on, you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. If you're living, uh, wanting to walk with God, come on, his blood covers us. His grace is sufficient for us. And come on, he's working uh, in us and bringing us into his stature and his nature that we would take on the fullness of Christ. Yeah. And if we're walking in obedience, nothing is impossible. Now, it doesn't mean God's a genie and we can wish for whatever we want to and he'll do it. No. The Bible says seek first the kingdom of God. The Bible says whatever we ask for when we pray, we're in that place of seeking God's will. And we begin to pray what God is wanting. We begin to pray his will. It will come to pass. His will be done, not ours. Are you here? And sometimes we get frustrated because we're wanting our will. Are you here? But many times our will is idols. We're coming for God. We're not asking for nations. We're asking for a new car. Wow. Come, on. Come on, a bigger house. And God's not against all those things, but those things shouldn't mean anything to us. Right. Right. So most we want, it, we want that new car, but why do we want it? To fill our insecurity so we can drive around and waste gas and everyone can look at us. Wow, look at them. And we feel successful because of the car we're driving? Yeah. Oh, it got real quiet here in Orange County. This, <laughs> are you here? That's not the focus. We're secure because of who God is in us. It doesn't matter what we drive, whether it's a new donkey or an old donkey. <laughs> Jesus had a new one. But what, that's not where our security comes. Our security comes that we're sons and we're daughters and we're walking with God and we walk by faith and not by sight and what's around us. We're not living according to the circumstances. Come on. Quit thinking about moving to Texas and Tennessee. God hasn't called you there. Come on. I love what Marvin said. God prospers us where we're at. Yeah. Isaac sowed a land of famine. He didn't get to run away. Yeah. Are you here? And let me tell you, Tennessee's not cheap anymore because now supply and demand is getting expensive. <laughs> I was on the plane talking to some people. They said the property market has gone crazy because everybody's moving there. But you need to be where God called you to be. Yeah. So we're, 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 we're praying, I want to get rid of this job. I need to get delivered to this job. Why aren't you getting delivered? Because you haven't finished your assignment. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. We got to be faithful where God has put us. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. In an impossible situation, well, I've got people, they're antichrist. The devil's hitting me everywhere. Well, guess what? We live in a world that's antichrist. Just go out and say, I love Jesus. And the people will look at you. <laughs> Don't give me that religion stuff. I'm not giving you religion stuff. I'm giving you relationship. And I'm telling you the truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. Because the truth will set you free. In Jeremiah 32, verse 17, they said, Oh, Lord God, behold, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched storm. And he says what? There is nothing too hard for you. I want you to say that together. Say there is nothing too hard for God. One more time. There is nothing too hard for God. When you say that, what comes up in your mind that you think is too hard for God? Why you just say it again? Because what happens? You think of your finance. You think of the, the situation with that person. You think of our government. You think of all the battles there. But let me tell you, there's nothing that's too hard for God. Yeah. Speak to the mountain. What is he talking about? The things you think that are too hard for God. He's not telling, we want, he's want us to move the agriculture. 
start moving mountains. I, I cast the mountain there and you cast it back and we're just moving mountains all the time. Sometimes as Christians, that's what we, we talk like it's like that. And that's what we say. What's the resistance in your life? to the call of God, to the purpose of God. Speak to it and, and watch and see what God will do. Nothing is too hard for God. Yeah. And we know the story. Abraham had a son, Isaac. Yeah. God did a miracle. We look at Elijah. Elijah wants a double portion. Is that too difficult for God? He says, no, it's not too difficult. If you see me, when I'm caught away, there was a journey to do that. There was a price to pay. He got a double portion anointing. According to your faith, Elisha with Elijah. Yeah. So we need, to, we need to get into faith, friends. We need to get back to our, our, our roots of why on earth are we here? Yeah. What is the purpose for our living? It's not just to work and pay bills and go to church on Sunday. Yeah. It's to go out and be a witness. It's to go out and proclaim our faith. As God puts us strategically in places, we need to be bold in proclaiming who God is. Yeah. We need to be bold in speaking against injustice. We need to be bold in declaring. It. And we do it in love. But come on, people, some people just don't like the truth. Back when you told people the world wasn't flat, they didn't like it. They thought the world ended in France there. But it's not. The world is round. But because the truth is the truth whether we believe it or not. And the truth will set us free, amen? Five things God wants to remind us this morning that are not too difficult for him. Number one, there is no promise too hard for God to fulfill. Say it out loud. Say, there's no promise that's too hard for God to fulfill. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, the eternal God, it says, is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy now, this is about Exodus. What's the context here? Children of Israel, they're there with Pharaoh. God's done the plagues, and what happened? Pharaoh is angry and wants to wipe out the Jewish people from the face of the earth. So what are they doing? They're running, and where are they running to? They're running to the sea. That's where they initiated the saying between a rock and a hard place. On one side, you've got the whole, Jew, the whole army with Pharaoh and his chariots. On the other side, a sea. Are you here? But what happens? In the midst of that place, Moses begins to praise God. He begins to lift up his hands. And what happens is he begins to praise God. God takes his little toe and hits the Red Sea and it parts. And they go through the Red Sea. And in the middle of the Red Sea, what happens? They go to the other side. As the Egyptians come, the Red Sea crashes about them. And in one day, in one moment, all the enemies of the children of Israel are wiped from the face of the earth. That's the context of this scripture. Now that's called supernatural. But these were people who were obeying God. Why? God told them to go there. But they weren't in fear. They, they stood praising God. That's what we need to do in the midst of it, not just knowing with our head that all things are possible, but in our hearts beginning to worship and begin to pray and declare all things are possible. God, I don't care what's going on. If there's a wall around me, I'm going to go around the wall of Jericho seven times and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Come on and watch the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. In a moment... Promotion comes from God. Everyone's talking about government. Oh, our government. And pray for our government leaders. Are you here? Yes. But I'm not concerned about government. In one moment, they can be gone. Yes. We used to live in, the, in a time where Hitler lived on the face of the earth and was trying to take over the earth. But his reign ended. Are you here? Yes. He's part of history, and, and, and God still has his way. So we need, to, we need to have that understanding and begin to stand on the promises of God. The promises of God are not, uh, are not based on who's president yeah. or whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Right. It's not based on the stock market. Oh, we're praising Jesus because we're in the green today. Hallelujah. And today we're in the red and we can't get out of bed because we're filled with anxiety. We got real quiet here. What are we putting our hope in? Nothing wrong with investment, but invest in something. Trust God and leave it alone. Don't, don't let your blood pressure be related to the stock market because that's where you're putting your source. God is, that's not my source. That's one of the streams God provides for me in when I walk in obedience. But I'm not motivated like the world by fear and greed. I'm motivated by common sense and the leading of God to look at what's the emerging industries. Are you here? And if we, 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 we know that, what will happen? We, we can be in the front of things because we're led by the Spirit. 
I ain't getting no amens on that. Come on, if God, Jesus can get the disciple to go down and pull out a coin from a, from a fish's mouth to provide, you think he can't provide for you and lead you? Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. Say nothing. nothing. It's too difficult for God. In Romans 15 verse 4, it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Stop listening to the news. Stop reading all the books, even some Christian books. They're not, you know, it's opinions that are there. Some people write books and they later get rid of the book because their theology changed. Nothing wrong with that, but that's third person. Get into the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't change. It's the authorized version. Are you here? And, and hope and comfort comes from the Scriptures. Put your hope in the Scriptures. Build your life on the Scriptures. We're tested by faith, by the prophetic Word of God, that we trust it, but our character is determined by how we live according to the written Word. Are you here? I'll say that again. Our faith is tested by the prophetic word, the word of a God coming alive, full of faith that requires something else. But, but our character, our life, how we're judged by God is determined how we line up with the written word of God. You don't need a prophecy when it talks about how to treat your wife. It's in the Bible. You don't need a prophecy on how to raise your children, no matter what people say. Come on. Discipline is not child abuse. Not disciplining your kids is child abuse. Because they think they can do whatever they want, whenever they want. And guess what? The law will come down hard on them. Because there's boundaries in life. Come on, you don't get what you want and take it. When you're in the grocery store, you don't get to take the gum if you didn't pay for it. Got real quiet here. Amen. Every head bowed. Every... <laughs> First Corinthians 10 verse 11 says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for what? Our admonition on whom in the end of ages have come. So all the stories of the Bible, as we talk about Daniel, we talk about Abram, we talk about David, we talk about Esther, we talk about Ruth, we talk, it's, it's, it's to encourage us and admonish us of what the word of, of God has said. No promise is too difficult for God. Well, I'm getting a little old. Well, Sarah was old. I got real quiet here. Come on, you need to go on Tinder to try to help the Lord. Well, well, I'm believing God for a partner. Well, that's God's will for us. If that's in your heart and God's put that in your will. But guess what? Don't rush the process. Because God might be working on that man because he needs to be in the right place to to walk alongside you and what you're called to do. Don't don't abort that and make it too early. And now you got to be in the middle of that process while God's working intensely. Or as a woman, as a man, look, I just want to get married. That's a dangerous prayer to pray. You could end up with a Delilah. Come on, pray specifically. Pray for the Proverbs 37 woman. 31 woman. Sorry. I slept at 2 o'clock also. Amen. The Proverbs 31 woman. 30, 37. I don't know what's in that, but anyway. Proverbs 31 woman. Just making sure you're awake today, all right? Proverbs 31 woman. Pray for that. Kind. Be specific. And what God's called you to do, are you here? In Titus 1 verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time, someone say due time, time. manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So how is the word manifested? How is truth manifested? Through preaching. You got to proclaim it. Abraham was going around proclaiming, I'm going to give you the father of many nations. They thought, this guy's getting a little senile. Maybe he's got early dementia. He, his wife, you know, can't have kids. Noah, what are you building? A boat. What's a boat? It never rained before. There's no water. But guess what? As the rain started coming, Noah was there. Are you here? you got to preach, and as you begin to proclaim what God has said, it will come to pass. The, the, many died in our Christian faith proclaiming what they didn't see, but because they proclaimed it, it happened. That's faith. Are you here? And we're, we're reaping the fruit of those that paid the price because they were willing to give their lives for it. What do the promises of God mean to you? The Bible says in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does that mean to you? What is the strength? Find strength in the security of his word. 
Find strength in the life of David. I find strength in I love Apostle Paul. That's why I'm so blessed. I've walked away from this. I, I'm going to stop complaining. I got nothing to complain about. I was in that hole. But he still kept his faith. He still didn't, he, he still began to bring transformation and still began to preach from the hole. There's a small hole and he's in the ground. How many of us would have backed and said, I'm not following Jesus anymore. He didn't give me what I want. I'm supposed to be blessed and prospering and in the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> and I'm in the Motel 6. <laughs> come on, come. Why aren't things happening? We got nothing to complain about, people. We need to count our blessings. Why well, I'm struggling. I need $1,000. Uh, look what they were. It was life and death. Peril. I was uh, there. I saw Patmos where he was shipwrecked, but he went on shore and preached and impacted that, that area where he was at in the midst of the opposition, in the midst of idolatry. He proclaimed in the, in the key places of society, and that's what we need to do. Yeah. Come on, we need to be in the city council meetings. We need to be, you know, when, when they're meeting in Sacramento. And begin to start declaring the truth and begin to get people aware and begin to speak. The, the, the worst lie of the enemy is that we're just supposed to stay in our four walls and play church. That's not the church. That's a, a, a bad community center. Yeah. Are you here? Yes. We need to, to prompt the promises of God. They, they bring security to us. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Is anything too difficult for him? No. We need to build our faith on that. Nothing is too difficult. Number two, there's no prayer that's too hard for God to answer. There's no prayer that's too hard for for God to answer. Anytime God does something, he always starts with a difficult situation. I mean, you look at the history. You look at Elijah calling down fire. What does he do? Pours water. Why did he need to do that? Because God likes difficult, impossible situations because it makes him look good. I got no amens on that. Think about it. In In the difficult situations that he's in, in a time of famine, Isaac reaps. Fair, I mean, you look at Joseph, accused to be an adulterer. You know, he's put in jail. He's all this stuff. And then he raises him up to be in the palace. Why? Because it makes God look good. Are you here? It makes a good story. Oh, I need to keep preaching on this. All our religiosity comes out. God, why did he make the heavens and the earth? Why didn't he just make planet earth? Because God likes to show off his glory. The Bible says the train of God, that means his robe, fills the whole temple. Why does he need such a long train? Come on, you're made in the image of God. Why do you look like to look sharp or look beautiful too? We're made in the image of God. God is not a God that he's proud. He's not arrogant, but he shows off his splendor. He shows off his glory. He shows that he's God. There's no God like him. He owns the universe. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Why would you need cattle on a thousand hills? Because you can. Because you're able And God puts us in difficult situations so he can show off his glory. When Jesus went to heal the man, the disciples asked, is this a curse because of sin? And what did he say? No, it's so the glory of God could be shown in this man's life. So in the midst of our negative situation, know that God wants to answer. Why do you go through difficult situations? You pray for God. People, I've heard people say, I came to God and all hell broke loose. <laughs> Come on. Right. Everything was seeming okay when I was on, you know, in, 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 the, in the enemy's camp. But all hell broke loose. Why? Because your house was built on the, on the, on the sand. You gotta build your house on faith of God. It's not how much money you got in the bank. It's not what you drive. It's not all the things. It's your relationship that I'm a son and I'm a daughter of God and I don't care how much I got in the bank. I'm blessed in my coming. I'm blessed in my going forth. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It doesn't matter what's happening around me or what situation I'm in. I count it joy at all times. That, that's, that's what Christianity, it's not based on circumstances, it's based on God. And so God likes to do something wonderful and miraculous, and he usually starts with an impossibility. Yeah. I mean, read the Bible, the woman, all she's got is a little meal and oil, and the prophet says, give it to me. Yeah. You'd think that, I mean, you'd think that's abuse right now. How dare you take that from the old little woman? 
she just let her have her meal in peace and let her and her son die. I mean, that's religion. But what she said, if the prophet asks for it, if the man of God asks for it, you give it to God. But look at the miracle that came out of it. Look at the miracle that came out of it. Look at the miracle that came out from a bunch of fishermen. Why did Jesus choose the fishermen? Because they weren't the intelligent ones. They weren't the eloquent ones. They had a lot of blankety blanks probably in their conversation. Jesus says, don't say that anymore, Peter. That's not good. Don't say that word, Peter. You got to be a man of God. But what did he do? He took the foolish things of this world and confound the wife. And as he came to the elect and they spoke with authority, they spoke with power. They said, these guys have been with Jesus. What happened to these fishermen? It was the transformation in their lives that was the biggest testimony in the signs and wonder. Are you here? That's why the Bible says God uses the foolish things. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be a fool. But what does it mean? Foolish in the eyes of the world. Because if we put our security in our education, we put it in our trust fund, we put it in all the things of this world, then our foundation is wrong. There's no prayer that's too hard for God to answer. He says, call unto me in Jeremiah 33, and I'll answer you and show you great mighty things which are to come, which you don't know. That's faith. When we got it all figured out, it's not faith. You know, people all come, you know, and I, 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 you know, when I start out, I have my two-year plan and my five-year plan, all of that. Now I have a six-month plan because he messes up the five-year plan. It doesn't happen the way I, I want it to happen because that's faith. If I got it all figured out, people come, well, God's giving me this 20-year plan. I laugh because, come on, all you saw was the mountaintops. Let me tell you, there's a lot more going on in that plan than you know of. Are you here? Because God is, is wanting to work in us in the process, but his word will come to pass. Release faith for the answer prayer. It doesn't matter what's happening. We had a crisis of faith because many Christians, their president, who they wanted, wasn't, didn't win. And people backslidden, so shaken in their faith. Don't put your faith in who's president. Put your faith in God. Come on. Hitler walked on the face of the earth, but he's in a tomb. He's gone. He has no impact anymore. And I'm not saying light of what he did, but guess what? God is still around. God has the last say. Read the end of the book. We're on the winning side. And as we keep walking with God, it's gonna, all things are going to come to pass. Be secure in that. And we go through some difficult times. We have some dark days. But just keep walking because it's a day. It's not the end of your story. Keep praying, keep walking, and let God be glorified. Matthew 18, verse 19 says, Again, I say to you, if two or three of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father. God's not limited by circumstances. He's not limited by what's happening around us. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too difficult for God? So keep praying. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Why is that scripture there? Because we get weary. I get weary sometimes too. But as I go and I met, God, what have I got to complain about? Are you see here? Come on, we're blessed. If you live in this nation, you're more blessed with all of our problems. Come on, when you walk through customs and immigration, thank God for America. We're still very blessed. We're a work in progress right now. There's some things that are pretty scary, but guess what? God's going to have his way. God's going to have his people. Come on, we're one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty just for all. And that's, we're going to stay under God, no matter what anybody else says. Some of you didn't get that, but anyway. Number three, there is no problem too hard for God to solve. Look at the problems that we face. There's no problem. The homeless problem is not too difficult of a problem. The drug problem, the suicide problem, the sexual addiction problem that we're facing, it's not too difficult for God. And I've had it as a pastor because sometimes, you know, especially in early years of pastoring, you know, you meet a couple for marriage counseling and like the volcanoes are erupting. And they're spewing, you know, volcanic ash at each other and, and burning each other. And you're sitting there, you can't even get a word in. And I'm thinking to myself, this thing is over. Because we can't even agree to talk. And you're there. But God, do I have faith to believe beyond what's happening that God is fighting for marriages? And I've seen God turn things around in the midst of situations and change the heart of stone and make it hard of flesh. And God brings things around. Some of you were in that kind of place. Some of us have told their stories and their testimony. That's how it becomes a testimony because it was a test, but you, you opened your life to God and God began to work and, and God began to turn things around. That's who God is. Yes. 
He's the God of the tenor, t- turnaround. Nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing is hard for him to solve. You have a business problem. It's not too hard for God to solve. Some of your problem is $1,000. I need $1,000. It's expensive to live in Orange County. To many people, that's not a problem. But what used to be a problem for you, if you keep walking and growing with God, it's not going to be a problem. Because what, now you're 1,000, you're believing for 10,000. And now you're 10,000, it's 100,000. It's just a number. Are you here? But is God our provider? Does he say he provides all of our needs? So if your need is 1,000, he can provide. If your need is 10,000, we need tens of thousands of dollars every month for our ministry and what we're doing and my business. And Susan, we've got a lot of things going on. But what used to keep me up at night doesn't keep me up at night anymore. Because my faith has grown. So in the midst of, of that, knowing as God answers our prayer, our faith grows. And what happened? We got no, no problems too great for God to solve. I don't care if it's a million dollar problem or a $10 million problem or a $500 problem. What is it to God? According to our faith. We got to grow in our faith. But keep believing God. Nothing is impossible. Pray big prayers. Don't pray small prayers. Well, I'm believing God for a thousand. Well, why don't you pray for the three thousand so you don't have to believe every month? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, I'm out the. You know what? We went we there when we were there, and you know we, we saw this house, and it was called the billionaire home. We took a picture in front of it. I'm praying for billions of dollars. Yeah. Thank you for your agreement with me. Yeah. Come on. Why? It costs a lot of money to do missions. It costs a lot of money to do television. It costs a lot of money to plant churches. It costs a lot of money to run Bible schools. It costs, you know, that's the the church. It costs a lot of money to help people and rehabilitate them. But God is not limited. We need to grow in our faith and pray big prayers and believe that God is able. Some people find it hard to believe God, that he's able in their lives. But as we see the faithfulness of God, what happens? Our faith grows. When's the last time you prayed and got a prayer that was answered? Well, six months ago, God answered my prayer. Well, what's he been doing in the last six weeks? Well, 60 years ago, God answered our prayer. Revival came to a nation. What's been happening the last 60 years? Do we stop praying? We need to stay connected in prayer. If, if we're not praying and we're just hoping, that's not faith. Faith is where we ask. Yeah. Keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking, and it comes to pass. I'm going to keep praying until I see it. Yeah. Elijah went up and he saw, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. He heard nothing. There was no sound of rain. It was an empty sky. <laughs> California blue sky. No rain, hot But what did he say? He began to declare, I hear the sound because he heard something in the spirit. He heard a rumbling in the spirit. And what happened? He told his servant, go. His servant comes back hot. There's no rain. (laughs) Go again. There's no rain. Go again. Came back. There's a a, 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 a cloud the the size of a man's hand. Now, back then they were a smaller build. My hand's pretty big. Smaller than my hand, a little cloud. And what is he saying? Let's run. Tell the king. Most of us, well, I'm not really sure if that's a cloud or maybe someone was smoking. (laughs) Why? Because he heard with the spirit. He knew God had said the famine was going to end. He knew it didn't matter what he saw in the natural. He kept praying until he felt the momentum. And then what did he do? He went to preach and proclaim what God had said. And guess what happened? The rain came. Come on. That's how revival happens. I don't tell you what, what everyone's saying. Well, there's no revival. Oh, God's cursed America. And oh, he's left and gone to Africa. No, he has not. God's everywhere. But I hear the sound of revival. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care of the seeker sensitive humanistic messages that are going on. I don't care. I hear the sound of a cry of God's people wanting the real, wanting revival, wanting a move of God, wanting to see transformation. Come on. And God hears the cry of his people and it will come to pass. So we keep praying. Well, you only got a church of 200 people, 180 people. It don't matter. There were only 120 in the upper room. Jesus only had 11 He can save with many or he can save with few. I'd rather have a Gideon's army than have what was seen as successful in the eyes of man but has no strength to it. But we can have both, amen? Amen. It's called making disciples. Psalms 37, you learning something? Bible says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. 
Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Come on, trust in God. Put your trust back in God. Put your faith back in God. It doesn't matter what's happening. Don't get in fear. Oh, recession's coming in 2023. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Come on, they've been saying we're going to run out of stuff for years. They're going to say we wouldn't even be back in churches. Now churches are booming again. People don't know what they're saying. Only God knows. But what has God said? Pray and believe. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Is anything too difficult for him? No. Let's get this in our spirits. Amen. Two more. Can you take two more? Number four. There is no person too hard for God to save. Yes. Don't give up on people. So as you look at people and you're like, I don't really know if there's any hope for that person. Come on, there's hope for that person. Yeah. God can take the heart of the whole stone, whole stone and make it a heart of flesh. You look at people, I mean, can you imagine the Apostle Paul? That time his name's Saul, murderer of Christians. But guess what? He saw a light. He got knocked off his horse. In the midst of his journey, he encountered God. And when it happened, even the, 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 the apostles at the time didn't believe it. They had to have a council meeting. Whether we should we even meet with this guy? Because of who he was. He was one of the ones that was there when Stephen was martyred. But come on, God can take the person of the hardest heart. Why? Because Paul was humble his whole life. He, he always said, I'm least of the apostles. He had no problem suffering for Jesus because he knew what, what he had done. But he wasn't the least. He was one of the greatest. Are you here? God can change that. We've got family members that we're believing God for. We've got children that we're believing God for. We've got people that, politicians that we think there's no hope for. No, God can meet with a person and change their heart. Keep praying. Keep believing. Yes. Nothing's too hard for God. Yeah. And God likes to take difficult people sometimes and turn their hearts around. Amen. Likes to take people that, that are the rebel and, and give them a, a, make them rebels with a good cause, not a bad cause. Rebel without a cause. I had a word over that with somebody one time. You know, God, you've been a rebel. And everyone in the whole church started laughing. And I said, now God's going to give you a cause. That's the God that we serve. He can take things around. Nothing is too difficult for God. Don't give up. Sometimes you got to put some boundaries there. If a person's toxic, I get it. But don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Are you here? Don't stop believing. Okay. There's no person that's too hard for God to save. Amen? You look at the story of the crippled man. And they were bringing him, his four friends tried to bring him to the meeting and couldn't get into the meeting. But they didn't go home. They kept believing. They kept praying for that man's salvation. So what did they do? They kept become creative. And what did they do? They climb up on the roof. And they start knocking on the roof. And, you know, people in the meeting, all the flaky people, oh, there's gold dust. It wasn't gold dust. It was the ceiling floating down. Come on. And, and all of a sudden, the ceiling opens up. Jesus isn't surprised. And this man, I put a picture of you, comes through the ceiling and wants healing. Now think about the, the faith of these people. In the midst of a difficult situation, they kept believing that it was possible. They got creative. They didn't go and ask anyone, is it okay if we put a hole in the ceiling? They didn't get permission. Do first and ask for permission later. Amen. When it comes to God. They, they, they put the man down, and what happened? They didn't, they didn't ask the man, is it okay to do this? Can this be done? You know, what's going to happen on the way down? We need to plan out and have an architectural drawing with the engineers of how should we le level him down too, too much on the left or too much on the right first. They didn't get permission of the homeowner. Wait a minute, we better get permission. Is it okay? Come on, they were in faith. And they, they, they pursued in the faith. And, and they could have thought to themselves, well, what if we drop him? And he bounces off the floor in the middle of Jesus' meeting. That would be worse. Now he's not just crippled, but he's got broken legs too. <laughs> Think about it. And we come up with all these reasons. But what happened? As, as, as they put this man down, Jesus looks at the man and says, sons, your, your sin are forgiven. And he looks to the people and says, because of your faith, this man was healed. It wasn't the man's faith. It was the four friends' faith. Yeah. Come on. They, they kept pursuing. They kept believing God. Can you imagine? I would love to see the after story. We need to make a movie about this. 
And what happened? They're hugging each other. They're going out to dinner. They're laughing about, you know, what happened. And people got, you know, sawdust in their hair and, you know, and all their charismatic stuff going on. And, and, and in the midst of the mess, God begins to do a miracle. Are you here? No person is too hard for God to say. But we got to be like those four friends that we don't give up. We keep praying. We keep preaching. We keep declaring. Come on. And God will do the miracle. I like the musicians to come. What have we learned so far today? Nothing's too difficult for God. There's no promise that's too hard for God to fulfill. I want you to say it. Number one, there's no promise too hard for God to fulfill. Number two. Number three. Number four. And I like this one. There is no place where God can't send a revival. There's no place where God can send a revival. Every pastor's like, oh, my city, my city. Why is it hard? Because that's what you're called to plow. Come on. I, I, revival's coming to Orange County. Revival's coming to California. People are leaving, but God is coming. Don't miss out. Come on. Well, what about this? What about all the problems? What do we got? Oh, our governor. It's not dependent on that. Sometimes you need a bad time for people to cry out to God. When things are going well, the children of Israel always forgot about God. But in the midst of this situation, they remembered God and they began to cry out to God. Come on, it's a time we need to be crying out in prayer. We need to be seeking God for revival. I love studying history. and We see the story of the great Welsh revival. And those that study, they said there were four attributes of this revival. It was known about being a prayer revival. But the first attribute was that they had a, a strong sense of sin. They condemned sin in themselves. There was a strong sense of holiness that was upon them. Not because of religion of do's and don'ts, but like, I don't want to play with strange fire because I want the real fire. I don't want to allow sin in my life because I want the glory. And when we get in that place where we begin to, to begin to put aside things and we don't want to allow things in our life, dead things in our life that will choke out what God has put into us. That's the heart after God. That's not religion. That's the pursuit of God. Because I'm pursuing God, I don't do other things. The Bible says that a soldier when in service doesn't get ensnared in civilian line. Why? Because he's trained. An athlete trains a certain way. Why? Because they know they need to be ready. And that was the, how they sensed with that they, they condemned sin in themselves. Number two, they completely obeyed God in every matter. If God said something prophetically, if God, they immediately did it. They didn't need five confirmations and needed to fast and pray for two years. We need to be quicker to obey God sometimes, even when it doesn't mean our agenda. Thirdly, they had a compassion and a burden for the lost. They had a burden for those that were unchurched, for those that were unsafe. For the, the, in, the, in Welsh, in that area, it was a place people would drink and they had all the pubs and all of that kind of life. They, they, their heart was praying for them. They weren't condemning them, oh, those lazy people. What's wrong with them and coming into my world? They had compassion. And finally, as I mentioned, number four, they prayed out of that heart. And as they began to pray, God began to shift the atmosphere. God began to change the, the supernatural began to change the natural. And people would walk by as documented in the midst of their services. The presence of God was so thick that people would come in and open the doors and run to the altar and fall on the altar crying out and say, I need to be forgiven. I want to repent of my sins without anyone preaching to them because of the glory of God. We see that in Azusa Street, not far from here in LA, where the glory of God was there. People would come in, they're not even saved. Once they got in the room, God would heal them and miracles would happen, creative miracles, signs and wonders would happen. That was documented on three different occasions that people walked by and they called the fire department because they looked up, they saw flames coming out of the top of the building and said, oh, the building's on fire. And the, the, the fire department came. There was no fire in the natural. There was a fire in the spirit. And people came from all over the nations and came and got filled with the Holy Spirit again. People had preached and said, oh, there's no more deliverance. There's no more healing. God doesn't baptize people in the Holy Spirit. And as they came into the meeting, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And revival went all throughout the nations of the earth. Come on. Then I prophesy, I declare Come on, it's going to happen in Orange County. It's going to happen in Orange County. Come on, it's going to happen in Orange County. Come on, let's stand on our feet. 
The Bible says, and it's still true today, in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, if my people, are you part of his people? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm part of his people. My people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Come on, we need to be reminded nothing is impossible with God. We need to, come on, begin to tune our ears into what God is saying. Tune our eyes into what God, was, God is saying. And remember where we come from. You know, as I was cruising, I kept singing this song Almost every day I get up in the morning and start singing it and I, in the afternoon I start singing it and I, I text Steve and I said, I wanna sing this song this week because we need to be reminded of what Jesus has done for us. We need to be reminded of the power of the resurrection because it says that same power is in us. And I texted and I said, I wanna sing this song, you know? And he said, oh, Sophia already put this song in. So she was in the spirit this week, but come on. He healed my heart. He changed my life. Come on, he, he set me and brought freedom in my life. I thank the Savior. I thank the Master. Come on, I thank God. We need to be reminded, come on, we have a long heritage of people, of victory. We need to get out of the place of grumbling, of complaining of our situation, and begin to speak to our mouths, begin to declare what God has said, begin to pray. If you're praying and your prayers aren't availing, come on, pray more. Pray more fervently. Keep praying and grab a hold of the altar of God and cry out to God until you see and you hear the sound of abundance of rain. You begin to sense in your spirit things are shifting. I don't care what I got in my bank account. Come on, I'm prosperous. I don't care what happens and how many people show up for my church service. Come on, we're changing our nation for Jesus. Come on. I don't care what's going on in my business. Come on, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm first and not last. Come on, I'm a part of a legacy of world shakers, of history makers. Come on, let's sing it out. Hallelujah. Jesus. Turn me around. You set my feet on solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the savior. sing this song in faith, what happens? Your, 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 your knee starts moving. Come on. You got to start getting a little groove in you. Come on. Because he healed my heart. He set me free. Come on. I think it's not something I've experienced just in my mind. It's just not religion. Come on. It's an, an atmosphere that I carry. It's an encounter I had. Come on. Come on. I want you to sing it out. Come on. Come on. He healed my heart. same faces you got a situation that doesn't look so god good but what do you do come on you say i'm free you say begin to encourage yourself in the lord he healed my heart take me around place my feet on solid 